This roadside lagoon along Humboldt County's coast is Yurok country. The tribe calls it Chepek Akta. That was a village out there, probably up until like the early 1800s. Before gold miners and early settlers arrived, there was more than 70 villages in this area. All up and down the coast, there was villages, but when the settlers came, it kind of forced everyone out to reservations. For over a hundred years, Chapek, as it was called for short, was destroyed. The land overhunted, the water overfished, and when the blacktop roads were laid in the 1920s, businesses claimed the land and built diners, a motel, a gas station, and turned the Chapek into a primitive playground for tourists. The tribe had this space lost, and it was essentially a restaurant, essentially a place to stay for non-native people. Then in the 1980s, California State Parks claimed the land and called it Stone Lagoon State Park. It's called a genocide. That's what it was. For nearly 40 years, the Yurok had little to say about what went on in the park. I'm sorry on behalf of the state of California. That is, until an apology by California's governor set in motion a change that has never happened in the state park system. Not until recently, the Yurok tribe and state parks didn't have a good relationship. And now they're doing a pretty good job of working with the Yurok people. In the summer of 2020, the Yurok tribe was given joint powers of authority by the state, making them the first tribe in the park system to have full control over the visitor center and hire staff. The coastline has these villages, which are called Nur or Nur. Today, Yurok tribal members like Kesselam Aquilin and Jacob Reed control the narrative. They share with tourists the history of the Chapek Akta in their new visitor center and on guided kayak tours across the lagoon. The hope for the tribe is that, you know, we're here and we'll hopefully pass this knowledge down to future generations and can continue to grow. Reporting on Native American Heritage Month, I'm John Bartell. Kuchi Aima, Kaneo Yaset, Jesus Tarango, Tribal Chairman, Wilton Rancheria. Good afternoon. My name is Jesus Tarango. I'm the Tribal Chairman of Wilton Rancheria. So I would say I was uh, blessed and, and fortunate to be able to grow up in my culture and traditions. My mother uh, was a dancer of Bill Franklin's when she was a child. He's a student and he was a teacher uh, of our cultures and traditions. Carrying that tradition and passing that on to her children. Me and my siblings were, were raised in the same. For 50 years we were, we were terminated by the federal government. Uh, but some of our elders led a, a fight um, to regain our recognition. My mother was one of them. June 8, 2009, um, you know, the, the tribe, uh, we won our case against DOI and, and we were reinstated our, to our federal recognition. Being a tribal chairman, uh, you know, it's truly, it's truly an honor. Uh, my people were a seven generation people. Um, and so the, the things that we do today, it, it's not for me to benefit from. It's for somebody else to come two or three generations uh, away from me. Of the more than 280 state parks in California, just one of those parks require a boat to get to. That park is Ajimawi Lava Spring State Park. Many who visit choose to kayak or canoe, starting from a small boat ramp just outside the little town of MacArthur. It's here that a narrow channel surrounded by grass and tule plants eventually leads you to open water. Now, depending on what part of the park you want to visit, uh, you're probably going to have to paddle upwards of two miles. Ajimawi Lava Spring State Park is one of the nation's largest underwater spring systems. The crystal clear water literally boils from the ground and feeds a spider web of lakes, rivers, and creeks, ultimately saturating Shasta County's Fall River Valley. Now, when you finally do reach the park, you're going to want to be respectful because this area was and still is the ancestral home of the Ajimawi people. We're um, keepers of the land from the Creator. Ajumawi are we are the, the water people, and some people they call it is where the rivers come together. Virginia Mike is a cultural liaison with the Ajimawi people, which is a band of the Pitt River tribe. I mean, look how beautiful it is right there. Yeah. You can, see, uh, you, I, can you see the fish? Virginia teaches younger tribe members like Antonio Mendoza about the Ajimawi culture and the importance of the water that helps isolate and protect the ancestral lands here. The importance of the water to the Ajimawi people because it's life. Without water, there's no life. 
As she walks Antonio and I along the lava rock trails, Virginia leads us to a shoreline. Here, you can still see ancient fish traps built by the Ajimawi fishermen. They may look like piles of rocks, but those rocks are placed in such a way that trout and sucker fish could be pushed up or herded from deep water to shallow pools. The opening are out, are out there where we herd the fish in. And once we herd them into that pond there, then we close it down and they are herded further in up here into the shallower areas where they're easier to catch. We are not sharing the location of these fish traps to prevent disturbance, but Virginia wants visitors to know what those traps look like so boaters can avoid them. This is what we're trying to protect because people try to drag their boats up into these traps to, to get out. And we're trying to explain to them like, you're destroying you know, our, our fish traps. You know, this has been here for years. There's a long history of non-native people disturbing Ajimawi and Pitt River tribal territory. With the help of the US military, early settlers in the 1860s forced Ajimawi onto reservations so their land could be farmed and logged. We were massacred for our land. You know, they put bounties out on our heads, you know, $100 a head. Why aren't you in here asking PG and Italy? They're the ones that are trespassing on the land, not the Indians. By the early 20th century, much of the remaining Ajimawi land was acquired by Pacific Gas and Electric Company. They built hydroelectric dams, which ultimately blocked salmon from spawning up to Ajimawi water. In an effort to right a wrong, the government agreed to pay reparations to the Ajimawi and Pitt River tribes, who had land taken from them. The money is compensation for land taken from the Indians' ancestors in 1853. Pearl and the other members of the Pitt River tribe intend to refuse the checks. This 1970s documentary shows the conflicts that arose after the tribe learned they would only be paid 47 cents an acre for their land. The pitifully low price was based off the going rate for property back in the 1850s. I couldn't even buy bread at that 47 cents an acre, that's what I say right now. In 1975, California State Parks acquired 6,000 acres of private land and former Ajimawi territory and then turned it into the current day park. It's a bad type of a genocide that happened to our people. I can't change it. The only thing I can do is move forward to make, try to make things better because I have my grandkids that I bring out here. Virginia hopes that one day the ancestral land will be returned to her people. But for now, she uses the park to teach the tribe's culture to younger generations. You know, it's a great honor and great priv privilege to be out here for me, you know, to learn and gain this knowledge, you know, and, and learn about my ancestors and what, what life was all about. If you visit the park, you will find campsites and barbecues, but you'll also see the remnants of a sacred land once inhabited by the water people, the Ajimawi tribe. It's a traditional place, you know, for my people. It's, it's our culture, mm -hmm. you know. We're not cattle herders, we're fish herders. From Ajimawi Lava Springs State Park, I'm John Bartell. Hello friends and relatives, my name is Angelina Hinojosa, my tribe is Penelope Pomo Nation. I am 18 years old, I'm a first generation college student at Sac State. Traditionally and culturally, uh, as Pomo people, uh, we're really known for our baskets and that's something that's always been really beautiful to me. Back then, um, we used to sell them just to make a living. We still carry a lot of our stitches and just like teachings passed down. This goes actually for all tribes throughout California. We have an annual event every year called A Big Time. And it's a gathering where our people all come together each year and we invite everybody, uh, tribal and non-tribal. And we share food, we share songs from where we're from, and we have other people come share their dances. It wasn't that long ago that our people weren't even as allowed to practice our traditions. We had to go into hiding. They were putting our kids within boarding schools. At one point, they didn't want us here. And for me to be here today is a blessing within itself. It's the fact that I get to be my ancestors' prayer.
For the first time, a monument honoring California Native Americans stands in Capitol Park in Sacramento. It's significant for us because representation matters. A ceremony was held Tuesday for the bronze sculpture of William Bill Franklin. Because of the works of him, you know, my, my people have their culture uh, to carry on. Bill Franklin represents the best to be found among California Native Americans. Jesus Tarango is with Wilton Rancheria. It's the only federally recognized tribe in Sacramento County. He says Franklin dedicated his life to reviving traditional Miwok and Nisinan songs and dances. He was my captain uh, of our dance group. And so as a, as a child, you know, he was our, he was our leader. Franklin fought to restore indigenous people's rights to human remains and cultural items. I know my grandfather would be very proud and to represent Native Americans for California, but I think he'd be more proud the fact that Native Americans are being recognized now. But we're here because of the resiliency of our elders. Assemblymember James Ramos is the only California Native American serving in the state's legislature. He helped pass legislation to create this monument. Now school-aged children and even adults visiting the Capitol will be able to see, see a California Indian person and start to ask the question, what's the true history? The monument replaces the statue of Huna Perro Serra. We're bringing to light the true injustice that has happened against California Indian people. Serra was a Spanish Franciscan priest and missionary. He came to the New World in 1749 to force Native people to convert to Christianity. Historians say the mission period overseen by Serra involved the enslavement and genocide of indigenous people. A lot of people um, from Indian reservations when we went to schools, um, we were forced to make and build missions uh, to learn about the missions and the Spanish exploration. But we're never able to tell the true story from the Indian perspective of that history and the treatment towards California's first people, which was horrid. Peter Burnett was elected California's first governor in 1849. He fueled the enslavement and genocide of indigenous people. The first governor in the state of California put out bounties on, on Indian people paid for with taxpayers' dollars, militias in the state of California, that then was reimbursed by the federal government to form militias with the sole purpose of ridding and going out and killing Indian people here in the state of California. John Sutter enslaved indigenous people, forcing them to build Sutter's Fort in 1840. It's that history that needs to be taught so that other people could understand why Native people feel the way we feel. California formally apologized to Native Americans in 2019. I'm sorry on behalf of the state of California. When you talk about injustices, the Native American people have always been um, at the forefront of that injustice. In 2020, several statues in Sacramento were removed, like John Sutter, Huna Perro Serra, and the Christopher Columbus and Queen Isabella statues. Find out about those people, and then find out what, what are they being replaced with. And what's the significance behind that? Sacramento City Unified School District renamed Sutter Middle School to Miwok Middle School earlier this year. Peter Burnett Elementary is now Suyu Elementary. Suyu is the Miwok name for a hawk. When you have the school name changes, it at least gives me hope that people are wanting to have that conversation about well, what really took place then. It's about coming full circle and acknowledging a horrid past so that true, true, true healing can take place here in the state of California. Hasasaga, Nikki Yamkakan, Calvin Hedrick. I am Mountain Maidu, and I am a community organizer with the California Native Oak Project based here in Sacramento, California. Up in Lassen in Plumas County, uh, we have a yearly bear dance, which signifies that the long winter has ended, spring is back, and we celebrate our new year. So many of our um, our leaders up in that area um, who are no longer with us kept those ceremonies alive, sometimes even when they were illegal. Our young men are wearing their hair long again. Generations of, of people from our community were not allowed to have, have their hair um, long. Well, young Native people were taken away to boarding schools where their hair was cut and that was taken from them and they were taught to just assimilate into the greater society. And it's so powerful to have a, a young person who's like 
you know, seven or 10 or 12 or 15 who comes and says, I grow my hair long for my ancestors, for my grandparents who couldn't. One of the things that I think is really important during Native American Heritage Month is that we um, forget talking about Native American people in the past tense. And when people said when they were here, I say we are here. You can't change the past, but you can make changes in the present. This park is still super important and managed differently. And change was made here. We are walking towards Sume Village, and Sume Village was completed in 1989. Long before State Park interpreter Kessela McQuillan guided visitors into this clearing of Humboldt County redwood trees, the land was called Patrick's Point, named after homesteader Patrick Began. He caused violence within the Yurok community. This land was Kessela's ancestral home, a Yurok tribal village. But in 1864, Patrick Began brought in an armed militia and massacred villagers, ultimately making more room for homesteaders to take over Yurok land. His name kind of stuck here, and so that's why it was named Patrick's Point State Park um, until it was changed. It's called a genocide. That's what it was. And so I'm here to say the following. I'm sorry on behalf of the state of California. It would take the Yurok tribe decades of petitioning and an apology by the governor to trigger change. But in September of 2021, Patrick's Point State Park was changed to Sumeg State Park. Today, the park is a recreation of the Yurok village and the homes that once stood here. Your traditional plank houses have a unique type of engineering. So the door is would actually be a lot smaller than this to keep out um, predators. After the massacre at Patrick's Point, Yurok all over Humboldt County were forced into reservations. And these traditional redwood plank houses were all destroyed. And this would essentially be where we would live, where we would spend time with our families. As reservations grew in the early 1900s, the government did their best to erase Yurok indigenous culture. Skills, lifestyles, beliefs, and languages were all nearly lost. But with the help of tribal elders, these plank houses were rebuilt to preserve the tribe's old way of living. Everything's enclosed and you don't have a lot of natural light within your house. And so here we would have the ability to take the planks off and on whenever you, would, you needed. From the sweat lodge to the traditional dress house, visitors are free to explore the village. The purpose of Sumeg State Park is to encourage visitors to re-examine our past and reflect on the suppressed culture of indigenous people. We just believe that Redwood houses us and takes care of us and helps us transport each other. So it's a very complex system that we truly believe kind of relies off of each other. I just hope that visitors understand that that this spot is special to us and this is our home and we're here for forever and we'll continue to hopefully steward these places until future generations take over that. Reporting on Native American Heritage Month, I'm John Bartell. My name is Alexandria Russell and I'm White Mountain Apache. Being a Native American elder here in Sacramento, I take pride and honor with it because it comes to responsibility as an auntie and elder to continue to share our culture, tradition, and wellness. My husband and I, Larry Russell, for over 30 years, we have been in the classroom with the Indian education and local agencies to promote and share our gift and medicine, which we call Southwest Pottery. Since we're taking the clay from the river, we have to give back. So we also teach our youth and families that when you're working with the clay and you're thinking about presenting it as a gift, you wanna have that good energy. As an elder, sometimes people think this is time for retirement, but this is the time for me. We all have a role in the community from children, youth, adulthood, and elders. And I look forward to the day I just sit down and see our youth leaders continuing maybe something that I may have started.